I know, I know, it is hard to believe there are evil characters in these friendly and peaceful games, but brace yourselves, they do exist. Well, today we will talk about the most evil characters in Souls games. Some are wannabe villains and some are the embodiment of everything that is wrong in their world. So naturally, I will rank them based on how evil they are. Grab a snack and get ready because this will get interesting. Also, if you don't want to end up on the villain list, like and subscribe or I'm putting you right at the top of the list. Manus is a difficult character to talk about. His existence brought more destruction and fear to the world than even the chaos itself, and he is without a doubt the most dangerous creature to ever exist in the world of Dark Souls. None of his actions had an evil motivation behind them, he is indeed evil, but he was following his nature, and this is why I decided to place Manus so low on the list. Manus was a primordial human, the virtue pygmy who was so easily forgotten. In the ancient times, long before the Age of Fire, Manus was a simple human roaming the underworld. He possessed the powerful Dark Souls, we can say he was the father of all humanity. With the immense humanity and Dark Soul he possessed, he created the early form of sorceries quite the opposite of the one Seed the Scaleless created. His sorceries were more primal, they were created by the manipulation of humanity. Manus lived a long life and died without leaving a legacy behind. The only thing he had was a broken pendant and also a wooden catalyst. At one point in history, dragons were slain and humanity spread across the world and created many new kingdoms. A human kingdom, Volusil, was formed where Manus was buried. The Age of Fire started slowly fading. And as a last resort, Gwyn sacrificed his body to start a new Age of Fire. Yet the cycle repeated itself, and the second Age of Fire was also coming to an end. And as the world tried to figure out who was going to start a new Age of Fire, the primordial serpent Kate had other plans. Kate needed a champion to start the Age of Darkness, so he did what he does best, he picked yet another human kingdom to corrupt. This time, Kate didn't want to rely on simple humans, so he traveled to Olusil and convinced convinced its people to resurrect a long dead soul. Soon they resurrected Manus. But there was a problem. The Ulysseal nobility robbed his grave when they first set foot on these lands. Manus realized his pendant was missing, so the search of his pendant drove him crazy, and his body was consumed by his dark soul. Manus unwillingly transformed into a deformed monster. His dark soul covered the entire kingdom of Ulysseal and corrupted everyone within. The entire kingdom was turned into deformed monsters. They all lost their minds and they all went crazy in short time. Gwyn and the other lords were especially weak against the dark, so Manus was a direct threat to the entire Anolondo. Manus all by itself could wipe out the entire race of gods and lords just by existing, and the longer he was kept away from his pendant, the stronger his dark presence became. Manus was a creature that could corrupt any human who was exposed to his soul, and he could simply wipe out the lords with his presence. Manus is a tragic villain because he didn't wish to be resurrected, yet he was brought back to life and pushed to insanity after losing the only valuable thing he possessed. Yet regardless of his power, I decided to put him so low on the list because not only he didn't deserve his fate, but also his actions were not his choice. Yes, he could destroy the entire world, but that's not because he enjoyed it, that's not because he wanted to destroy the world, but he was resurrected and he just went mad after losing the only thing that he owned. By the actions of others, he turned into a monster that could just destroy the world. Who is more evil than building up his character for the entire game, only to end up with a terrible boss fight? Well, I said it for Gideon Ofnir, but now that I think it again, I think it applies to a couple more bosses on the list. Hmm. Well, Gideon Ofnir holds the great rune of sheer disappointment anyway. He's so underwhelming as a character that he even fails to be a remarkable villain in his game. But he is a villain nonetheless, so let's figure out why this loser is evil. Gideon Ofni is the leader of the Round Table Hold. He is yet another tarnished wishing to become the Elden Lord. While he doesn't say it directly, his adopted daughter Nephele quotes Gideon a couple times in her questline. Gideon puts his knowledge about anything, his spies roam the lands between day and night to gather useful information to help Gideon Ofni achieve his goals. He connects with two fingers to learn Merica's secrets and makes up his mind he has to be the Elden Lord. He will manipulate and use everyone in his 
his pet to become the Elden Lord, he adopts Nephili because he believes a naive, loyal barbarian will greatly help in his cause. He sends his spy network to find the locations of demigods he has not yet found. In search of Halic Tree, he kills an entire village of all Binarics, and then he sends the Edgelord Ansha after you to grab the medallion. Gideon pretends he didn't send an assassin to kill you, but with his assassin gone, Gideon decides to use Tarnished as a step to reach the Elden Throne. Throughout the journey, his spies follow Tarnished from a distance. Gideon is nowhere near as powerful as many other villains in Souls franchise, however he makes it clear that he will use anyone and kill anything in his path to become the Elden Lord. He ultimately fails and is killed by Tarnished, but he leaves many villages raised and many kills up until that point. Compared to the other villains in this list, he is not as dangerous or as powerful as some of them, but once again he decides to be the Elden Lord and he just kills and uses everybody in his path to achieve his goal. But what are you gonna do, in the end he just offers a terrible boss fight and just dies like a regular enemy. Quite the underwhelming character entirely because of his boss fight. Before the lords took over, arch dragons were ruling the world. Majestic dragons were roaming the earth covered in nothing but fog and grey rocks. Gwyn's army and all the other kingdoms were no match for the everlasting immortal dragons until Gwyn found a way to kill these immortal dragons. Arch dragons are immortal as long as they possess their stone scales. However, among these dragons, there was one dragon inferior to all of them. It was Seed the Scaleless. Seed was a unique dragon in every aspect. He was was not immortal but his deformed body was infused with the moonlight. With the favor of the moon, he studied his body and created the sorceries. However, among the everlasting dragons, he never found his place. Being the father of sorcery, having the moon by its side was not enough for him. He only wanted to be immortal, so he rebelled against his own kin. He sided with Gwyn and fought against the dragons. He betrayed the dragons. You see, Seed willingly participated in the destruction of Age of Ancient just so he could have a chance to learn about the secrets of immortality. And he was successful. Among the fallen arch dragons, he found the primordial crystal. With the help of this crystal, Seed became immortal, but his body was still deformed. He still had no scales and he had no eyes. His immortality was a fake imitation of his kin. He wasn't satisfied. He became the duke and took over the royal archives. With the knowledge of the entire known history in his hands, he started studying. His hunger for for true immortality was the catalyst for his downfall. No matter what he did, he couldn't find answers and he slowly lost his sanity. After countless experiments, he created Priscilla, but her powers were too strong for even the gods, so without even thinking, he trapped Priscilla in a cold painting. He formed Channelers and Snakemen to be his eyes across Lordran. With the help of his newly created army, he started kidnapping and enslaving people. He would kidnap maidens, pygmies, pretty much anyone defenseless, and then he would lock them in the secret chambers of his archives. Throughout his life cycle, he locked countless humans to experiment on their bodies just to imitate the rock scales of arch dragons. As the time passed, he lost his sanity entirely. He had no intentions to stop until he could recreate the stone scales of dragons. He went so far to even kidnap the holy maidens of Guinevere. Seeing Seed was all lost, Guinevere decided to lock Seed with a holy barrier. Seed is a character who was entirely blinded by his goal to replicate stone scales and there was no stopping until he achieved his goal. After all, even the gods of Anor Londo couldn't kill him as long as he possessed this crystal. As a result, he kidnapped countless people to experiment on them and he turned them into deformed creatures. He would destroy another age without hesitation just to become immortal. In the end, because of his actions and these non-stop crimes, he was locked by the nobility and he stayed in his arms archives until he was killed by the chosen undead. Mo comes nowhere near as close as some other villains you will see towards the end of this video, but he's still one of the most evil characters in Elden Ring. Mo, just like his twin brother Morgoth, is just another lovely omen playing as a god. Born as an omen, twins were locked in the subterranean shining grounds. There, Morgoth tries to escape from his curse and serve the Golden Order. Mo, on the other hand, accepts his omen curse, he refuses to cut his horns, and one of them eventually grows so much that it pierces through his eye. 
Such pain gives him a vision to connect with an outer god called Formless Mother. Learning the cursed blood magic from this new god, Moog escapes the Shining Grounds and forms his own dynasty in a hidden location. Being an omen, Moog was locked underground for almost entirety of his life. Moog knows he is no match for most of the other demigods, so he hides. After the shattering, during the peak of the war, Moog sneaks into Halic Tree and kidnaps his half-brother Mikela. Mikela is an Empyrean with the potential to become a god and his absence does more damage to lands between than Mo could ever imagine. Halic Tree is a safe haven for everyone who seeks shelter, and with Michaela gone, Halic Tree loses its power and dies. In his absence, an alloyed gold needle remains unfinished, leaving Millennia forever infected with Scarlet Rot. Mo kidnaps him in order to strengthen his own dynasty. He kills Michaela and tries to resurrect him with the cursed blood. He shares Michaela's bedchamber and spends countless days there locked to resurrect Michaela as a god, and at that point you can imagine what happens when Michaela was locked in a bad chamber with Moog. No matter what he does, Michaela remains unresponsive, so Moog just decides to hide with Michaela's body until he magically resurrects again. Moog's goal is to create a god, take over the lands between and replace the Golden Order with his own dynasty. His army consists of all Minorix who are manipulated with the cursed blood, an army of mindless slaves. His followers are murderers who killed their maidens to enter Moog in palace. He killed so many people in his palace that he created rivers of blood, not the weapon, I'm talking about literal rivers flowing with blood. He is an evil force who will kill all who stand in his way. His story ends at the hands of Tarnished, however Mikela's story continues. Will he ascend as the evil god Moog always wanted, or will he cleanse from the cursed blood and ascend as a pure new god? These are questions that will hopefully be answered in Shadow of the Earth Tree, but we will have to wait until expansion is out. King Wendrick and his brother Aldia were the only people to ever have a chance to find a cure for the Undead Curse. Prior to the events of Dark Souls 3, Drenglake hosted the greatest kingdom humanity ever created. Drenglake was home to some of the greatest warriors and their innovations were a shining beacon to the rest of the world. King Wendrick was getting closer and closer to finding a cure each day, and with the help of Aldia, they could end the cycle forever. However, it all came to a devastating end under the influence of a single person. In Dark Souls 1, the greatest threat the gods of Lordran ever faced was at the hands of Manus. A beast had the potential to drown the entire world in darkness. That is where the Chosen Undead stepped in to stop this plague. Once Manus was defeated, his soul was shattered and his fragments were scattered across the world. In time, the Age of Fire faded and the fragments of Manus started gathering in the absence of light. With the fragments, four creatures of the dark were born, Nadalia, Elena, Alsana and Nashandra. Nashandra was the smallest of the fragments, so he was the first to combine all of her fragments and be born. Knowing she was the smallest of four, she yearned for strength, and her unending hunger for power brought Drenglake to ruins. In the shape of a human being, Nashandra arrived at Drenglake all by herself, and in no time her unmatched beauty seduced the King Gwendrick. Soon after, she was his queen. On her journey to Drenglake, Queen Nashandra saw that the Kingdom of Giants were preparing to invade Drenglake. However, this was nothing more than a lie. She convinced King Wendrick, and with his queen by his side, King Wendrick launched an invasion to Giant Lands before they could invade Drenglake. He left the Kingdom of Giants in ruins, he killed as many giants as he could, and he took many of them as slaves. Nashandra was successful. She tricked King Wendrick and claimed these giant souls. With these souls, Wendrick created many golems to build a castle for Nashandra. Soon, Nashandra was the queen of Drangleic Castle, with an army of golems in her hands to command. However, her hunger for power didn't end there. She misguided Vendrick once again and sabotaged his studies on the Undead Curse. Later, she weakened the Age of Fire by forcing firekeepers out of their post. This peaceful age was coming to an end when King Vendrick's soul caught the Undead Curse along with his entire kingdom. 
As if the undead curse wasn't enough, giants launched an invasion to Drang Lake in order to save the captives. Seeing all the enslaved giants were slain and turned into golems, the remaining giants were furious. They brought total devastation to the already weakened Drang Lake, and if it wasn't for the bearer of the curse defeating the giant lord, Drang Lake was going to be entirely destroyed by these giants. King Wendrick finally saw the true identity of Nashandra, however by this point, Wendrick had lost his entire army, his strongest warriors, and in his former glory. He had no way to fight back against Nashandra, so he locked himself in the only place Nashandra couldn't reach. He spent rest of his days in the Undead Crypt. He was the only king who came so close to curing the Undead Curse, yet by the trickery of Nashandra, he lost everything. He became an undead in a dark pit in the depths of the Undead Crypts. He lost his kingdom, he lost his army, he lost everything he had. In King Gwendrick's absence, Drang Lake was buried in Nashandra's darkness, and once again, and just like she tricked Wendrick, this time Nashandra tricked the bearer of the curse to claim Wendrick's soul for her. Nashandra is a unique villain because for her the only way to become the strongest was to bring the entire world to devastation. She started a meaningless war between two kingdoms and she had no intentions to stop until the entire world was in ruins. Elden Ring has many villains with extreme plans that can change the life entirely and curse the entire land. Dangita is one of these villains. He wants to bring curse upon the lands between and create a new civilization. If he could succeed, he could become the most evil character to ever exist in a Souls title. However, he lost the first spot because he lacks the strength to fulfill his goal. So his motivations were cool and evil, but he's still a loser in the end. In his early life, Dangita sees the vision of a curse that will bring pox upon life itself and bless all. With the vision, he changes entirely. While all the others despise omens, Dangita looks up to them. He sees omen as a blessing rather than a curse. He wishes to become one of them, so he wears this disfigured armor that resembles omens. He knows that omens can't return to Earth Tree upon death, so he wishes to create a world where he could starve the Earth Tree. Omens are seen as lesser creatures who are not worthy of rebirth. By turning the entire world to omens, Dangita wished this condition would become a social norm, and rather than a curse, it would be seen as a blessing by everybody. In order to create his ideal world, the solution was simple. He had to kill everyone in his path, guards, soldiers, civilians, children. He had to kill every single person in lands between and curse their soul. So that's what he did. He killed anyone he could, he opened their bodies, deformed and consumed their souls, and he left the body bodies infected with the seed bad curse. Their souls could no longer return to Earth Tree for rebirth, they could only return to their defiled corpse to be reborn as an omen. He killed many and cursed them to forever stay as omens. Without feeding on souls, Earth Tree could lose its power and a new age of omens could rise. But here's the issue for Dongita. He could never achieve his goal. He was more skilled than a regular soldier, yes, but he was no match for the high-ranking knights, let alone the gods. So, he was captured by the Golden Order, his execution took place shortly after the shattering, which meant that as a tarnished man he could reborn as many times as it takes to take over the world. Yet once again, he's still a loser. His own skills were the biggest obstacle in his path, and at this point in the story, it all comes down to Tarnish to decide. You can turn him into a mindless puppet, you can leave him in his cell, or you can follow his footsteps and defile the entire world instead of him. Dungita has one of the most evil ambitions among all the villains out there, but he was never strong enough to succeed in his goal. Sullivan was a humanoid creature born in the painted world of Ariandel. He was a young, ambitious sorcerer, quite different from all the other inhabitants of the painting. All the others seek refuge in the painting after losing everything they had. On the other hand, Sullivan was simply born in this cold, isolated world. Sullivan used his knowledge to create sorceries and spent his days studying. However, it struck to him that he didn't belong to this painted world. He had no future in a dying painting as he never experienced losing. Sullivan decided he had to leave the painted world and in doing so he found himself near at the outskirts of Irritil. 
Castile, a city founded by the descendants of the gods. Despite not having the noble blood or not being the descendants of the gods, he was accepted by the people of Iratil and he was even given a manor. His impressive skills as a sorcerer soon caught the attention of Gwyndolin. Sullivan became a well-known and respected sorcerer in Iratil in no time. One day, his curiosity hit and he decided to explore the sewage system near his manor. In doing so, he discovered an underground city beneath his house. He began exploring the profaned capital, also known as the City of Sin. So nothing could go wrong, right? He discovered a cold, eternal flame. He gazed into profaned flame. He had no idea this flame was fueled by the darkness in its core. And with this flame, Sullivan's heart was drowned in abyss. He left profaned capital as a different man. Once again, Sullivan wanted more. And through the trickery and manipulation, he began climbing the ranks of the Way of the White. First, he corrupted the city's holy knights. After all, Sullivan's flame was eternal, while the Age of Fire was on the brink of its end. With the holy knights corrupted, Sullivan gained a major force of power. He turned the holy knights into fire witches, gave them immolation tinders, earned their loyalty, and soon he was the most influential and powerful name in Irritil. He realized that he could take anything he wanted, and from this point on, Irritil turned into a living hell for its residents. Anor Londo and Irritil were under the control of Gwyndolin's younger, inexperienced sister Yoshka now. Seeing the opportunity, Sullivan locked Yoshka in a tower. With Yoshka locked away and Gwyndolin lying sick on his deathbed, Sullivan neutralized both the Blades of the Dark Moon and the Silver Knights. With two of the strongest forces out of Irritil, Sullivan gained the absolute power over the city. He created Great Sword of Judgment as a symbol of Gwyndolin's authority and he tricked people of Irritil to gather under his command. Being the absolute power over the city meant he could do anything, so he built a dungeon and started imprisoning and killing anyone who stood against him. He captured descendant of Gwyndolin and turned her into a dancer to humiliate the gods. He created the Dark Eye Rings for his new forces and sent them to other kingdoms in hopes of creating never-ending conflicts. Knights who possessed Dark Eye Rings could only heal themselves when they were fighting endlessly. So with the ring, Sullivan tricked them and gained their loyalty by force. They could never stop fighting or else they would just die. Sullivan assigned survivors from profane capital as the prison guards. He enslaved giants of Irritil and he began experimenting on others. He tried to create a new race of white dragons to strengthen his army, but he failed, and instead he created wretches. He turned other residents into monstrosities, and he locked the city in a powerful barrier that could only be bypassed by the dolls he created. Sullivan was now the only person controlling the city and the gods, but he was blinded by his ambition, and he was defeated by a force he least expected. Not the Ashen One, he was defeated long before he met the main character. Sullivan's heart was corrupted by darkness, but he wasn't the only one. He didn't control the abyss, he was a mere puppet. While he was busy ensuring no one would kindle the fires again, Abyss found a better, stronger ally in Cathedral that could take over the place of Sullivan. Coming back to life in his full power, Aldrich had no intention to becoming allies with Sullivan, so he marched his army to Irritil. Sullivan didn't want to give up on the position as the absolute leader of Irritil, so two armies clashed in a vicious battle. Sullivan lost the battle, however he was spared by Aldrich. Deacons marched through the streets of Irritil to take over Anolondo. Despite losing his army, Sullivan was spared and left alive until Aldrich was done devouring Gwyndolin. Sullivan is not the strongest villain, however he has done more damage to Lothric and Lordran than anyone could ever do. He trapped one god in an isolated tower and poisoned the other one. He corrupted the church and created a new god that is set to drown the entire world in Abyss. He enslaved and experimented on an entire city, he single-handedly prevented a new age of fire. He is without a doubt the most evil creature in Dark Souls 3, however he is still no match for the other villain you will soon see. Before we talk about the most evil villain in From Software history, let's check some honorable or dishonorable mentions. Patras is a minor villain in Dark Souls 1 who is supposed to guide and help clerics through their journey in catacombs, but instead he tricks and kills every cleric to keep Way of the White pure. Shura is a state achieved by forcing Sekiro down to a path of mindless killing. He loses his senses and he turns into a demon who kills anyone in his path for the joy of it. With his immense power, he slaughters an entire nation. 
all is a legendary shinobi who will backstab and kill anyone for power. He betrays Sekiro and attempts to kill him. Later finding him alive, he manipulates Sekiro to use him even further for his selfish goals. He even kills another boss off screen and I just can't deny how cool it is, but he is still one of the villains in Sekiro. Traveling across the lands between, you have probably realized how peaceful and beautiful Elden Ring's world is. Even the most dangerous locations don't seem to be as hostile as the world of Dark Souls. As the time passed, the world of Dark Souls grew darker and more desperate. The entire world was stuck in an endless cycle. But who's responsible of this world of suffering and pain? In Dark Souls, humanity was cursed by the light and sun. It all began in the Age of Ancients. Down on the ground, a creature who resembled humanity features found a powerful soul that belonged to unknown lords. With these souls in his hand, he filled the empty shell within and gained consciousness. With the help of the soul, he became the lord known by the name Gwyn. He blessed his kin with the souls, declared himself the king and formed a great kingdom in the underworld. He formed an army of silver knights and invaded the surface. At the hands of immortal dragons though, he faced a total defeat. Later, he formed an alliance with the Witch of Isolith and Gravelord Nito. He gave them two of his Lord Souls to strengthen their alliance, but the war was still not going in his favor. He was losing his precious Silver Knights left and right. He needed a lesser force whom he could easily sacrifice. And there he found the Pygmies. They were the first humans. Just like Gwyn, they were also blessed with a powerful soul. They were holding the Dark Soul, which rivaled Gwyn's own powers. Gwyn formed an alliance with them, and later to force them into submission. He convinced pygmies that they were inferior. In his next invasion, Gwyn used pygmies as meat shields so he could study the dragons. Soon he found out that the dragons were immortal due to their stone scales. It was during this time Seed betrayed dragons to steal their primordial crystal. Dragons took a heavy blow with this betrayal. After sacrificing thousands of pygmies and pulling Seed to his side, Gwyn had all the advantage in the war. He learned how to wield sunlight, he turned the light into lightning bolts and infused his army with lightning. With his new power as the god of sunlight, he could finally peel the impenetrable scales of these dragons. While Gwyn was busy fighting the dragons, Witch of Isolid and Gravelord Niso brought destruction to the dragons' homes. They destroyed the arch tree and the dragons had nowhere left to run. Gwyn won the war, killed all the dragons he could find, and later he even turned it into a sport among his race. They would chase and hunt dragons for fun, and they would display their heads as trophies. Gwyn won a brutal war by enslaving other races and hunting every single dragon. He sacrificed thousands of silver knights, but at the end, he started the Age of Fire. It was an age of peace and prosperity. But even in this age of peace, Gwyn only became more and more evil from this point onwards. Lordrum became the center of civilization. However, there was a problem Gwyn couldn't ignore. He defeated the dragons, but the pygmies were still around. Their dark souls were a threat to the throne, so as a solution, Gwyn tricked most of them and marked their bodies with a dark sign. He gave them a false sense of freedom. He offered pygmies a city at the end of the world, but within the walls of Ring City, they were trapped, so they built their own kingdom without knowing it was a jail they could never escape. To ensure that they would never riot or attempt to escape the Ring City, Gwyn gave them his youngest daughter. Even though he promised he would come back for her, he left Filianor to forever stay in this prison city. He gave another one of his daughters to seat the scaleless as a way to strengthen their alliance. And for his youngest child, Gwyndolin, he had other plans. He didn't want Gwyndolin to grow as an heir to throne, so he raised him like a daughter. Gwyn forced him to wear woman's clothing along with an enchanted ring, which would force Gwyndolin to act like a female. When it comes to his oldest son, Gwyn found out that his son befriended the dragons and allied with them. Being the most paranoid god out there, Gwyndolin assumed his oldest son was going to take over Lordran and start an age of dragons. As a result, Gwyn exiled his oldest son, erased him from all the books, and destroyed every single one of his statues. And just like that, he lost his favorite child. Gwyn grew more paranoid as the time progressed. He sensed that the Age of Fire was fading, so he asked the Witch of Isolid to replicate the flames. Rushed by Gwyn, Witches of Isolid failed in their experiment. They created the Chaos Flames instead of the first flame, which brought a total destruction to all of Isolid, killing and deforming everything it touched. And with this failure, demons were 
Stillborn. Gwyn saw demons as a rival to his throne once again. He believed demons would eventually find their way to surface and take over Anor Londo, so without any second thought, he invaded Isolid and killed every single demon he could find. By doing so, he turned the neutral demons into enemies of humanity. His paranoia brought chaos to the world, but it didn't end there. As his age grew weaker, he once again saw pygmies as a threat, and he decided to destroy the biggest pygmy cities. New Londo was one of them. He drowned the entire city, killed the entire population, all of its kings, and he created the New Londo ruins. Gwyn started an age that defied the nature of every single creature in the world. He hid the truth and locked the entire world in a hopeless cycle. He enslaved humans, demons, and dragons. He wiped out entire kingdoms just in case they could could turn against him in the future, he is the villain who is responsible for every single tragedy in the world of Dark Souls. Well, this was all for today. The next video is going to be the opposite, we will talk about the Heroes of Souls games. If you enjoyed the video and want to see more, don't forget to subscribe, it helps a lot, I will see you on the next one. Bye.